Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern. Sundays with Andrew Zarian. And it is Monday here on this show. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about here today. I don't even know where to start. I need Cody here to ask, what do you want to talk about today? Since the last time I was on this show... We've had the resignation of Vince McMahon. We've had the Royal Rumble. We have an injury to CM Punk. We had SmackDown and Collision and Rampage. We got lineups for upcoming shows. We got more news on The Rock. We got more news on Roman Reigns and Cody. We have so much stuff to talk about. Raw is coming up here tonight. So those are the main topics. We've also got an NXT a pay-per-view coming up on Saturday, a PLE. I think it's Saturday. And uh, that was a tie-in into SmackDown, and uh, there's stuff to talk about there as well. So we're probably going to start with the Royal Rumble and CM Punk, although we should note that TKO Group Holdings did today confirm Vince McMahon's resignation. They submitted an SEC filing on Monday, officially recognizing that Vince McMahon is no longer with the company. He's gone. He's not there in the background. He's not there doing whatever, going to the company gym. Vince McMahon is gone. And while Triple H is Vince's son-in-law, I mean, this is the first time in history there are no McMahons part of WWE in any way. It is a McMahon-free company. So lots to talk about there. I think most everybody knows most of the stories, but we can talk about pretty much whatever you want today. So feel free to head uh, send text messages my way. If you've got questions, comments, etc., text message 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. F4W online at gmail.com, as well as F4W online threads, Instagram, and Cameo at Brian Alvarez on X. Lots to talk about after the break. Observer Live. Where your absolute favor, you're like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm interviewing this person. Any favorite like moments that you had? Because you had some really fun moments with the talent yes. uh, when you're a backstage interviewer. Well, dating back, I'm sure you saw it on digital, on social, talking about the way. Do you remember Austin Theory and yeah, her? Well, Johnny Gargano, Candice Gargano, Candice LeRae, like it, the stuff that we would do for social media interviews for YouTube. That was like, it, it was almost a challenge to see who could laugh, make each other laugh first, because we would start the whole thing normal. And I wouldn't even ask John, I wouldn't even tell Johnny, hey, I'm going to ask you this question. We would just start it. 
And then he would go off on a tangent. And then I would go back with something that he didn't expect me to say. And we just had this dynamic relationship on camera with all of the way, which was so fun. Um, and then you look at like Javier Bernal, when I was doing the little back and forth thing with him. And that was a lot of ad lib. I think that a lot of people get the misconception that it's all scripted. I mean, to an extent, you know what you're going to ask, you know what your question is, you know what you need to get out of the interview. But I think how you give a nonverbal or how you respond in a moment whenever maybe says something, somebody says something that you weren't expecting, like how you respond to that is really what grabs the audience's attention because they feel the this authenticity behind it. They feel the genuinity of like, oh, okay, I can feel the emotion behind this interview. So I love doing this stuff with Javier because I think it was my first time that people were like, oh, Mackenzie has a personality. <laughs> Mackenzie, like, oh, I, this is who she is. Got it. Cool. Okay. You do have a little wit behind you. And then Grayson Waller, like the dynamic that we had between our interviews or when we were talking on camera was just, it was natural because how he would respond is how I would respond. And we just had that natural banter. What was it like working with Shawn Michaels? He's awesome. He's awesome. I don't know if you got the opportunity to meet him. I did actually. NXT. He's so nice. <laughs> yeah. And he's, and he's like not in, I mean, he's intimidating of course, because he's Shawn Michaels, but he's just a lovable guy. Like he's just there to listen and to help, to help you and to help the company. And, um, he, my husband, like he is Sean's biggest fan. If you say, who's your two biggest wrestling fans? Like, and I always joke with Sean. I'm like, if somebody said, okay, to Vic, you have to choose your wife or you have to choose Sean Michaels. I'd be gone. I'd be out. It would, it, I, I don't know. I don't hold a candle to you. And then you'd be like, no. So we always had a running joke about that. Um, but Sean's great. It was, it meant so much to see such the kind words that he had to say about me in the press conference. Um, I loved working with him. I am endlessly thankful for him and the experiences I had with him at NXT. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Snipper, VB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Well, where to start today? I guess what just broke. We'll start with that. As actually I first reported to my subscribers on Twitter, my super followers. CM Punk is injured. Tore his triceps. The rumor is it is torn off the bone. Very significant injury. And he will address it tonight on Raw. Now, if you watch the match, CM Punk didn't look good at all. And part of that looked like he was just tired. But clearly the other part of it is he was injured. And it happened when it came down to the last five or six. He took a future shock, a DDT from Drew, and grabbed his triceps, went right over to that referee in the corner, said it was his triceps, and... Just like in the match with John Moxley, he managed to finish the match. So credit to him for that. And he went back and forth with Cody. And Cody eventually tossed him out, won the 2024 Royal Rumble. So, for those of you that don't know, it is Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns is the main event of WrestleMania. So whatever they're going to do with The Rock is whatever they're going to do with The Rock. But The Rock is not walking in and changing the plans that they've had for the past year. So it is Cody versus Roman Reigns. I guess Rock could maybe do a different night of WrestleMania, or he could do a different show, or I don't think he's going to wait another year. But they are still planning on doing The Rock and Roman Reigns. But Cody and Roman is the main event of WrestleMania, and presumably Cody is going to finish his story. Now, I want to reiterate again, I've said this countless times, I do not know this for a fact, but for a lot of different reasons, things that I've been told, I believe that Cody was supposed to beat Roman Reigns last year, and Vince McMahon sauntered in, if you recall, on Saturday, he made his big return the WrestleMania weekend, and, uh, and things were different. Well, Vince is now gone. And they did not spend a full year t 
telling the story of Cody finishing his story for Roman Reigns to beat him again. So I fully expect that Cody is going to win the title at WrestleMania. As far as CM Punk goes, it was supposed to be CM Punk and Seth Rollins. Seth, obviously, he's got an injury. Now CM Punk has an injury. I don't think that CM Punk is going to be able to make WrestleMania. I suppose anything is possible. I would be very surprised. But uh, that is that. And I guess before we go into any of the rest of the news, any comments, Mike, or should I continue on? Uh, You know what? Go ahead and continue on for right now. All right. So the other notes from the Rumble, which tie into all of this. So we had two Royal Rumble matches, and the men's Rumble, as noted, was won by Cody. And because of everything going on with Vince McMahon, as I noted in the opening segment of the show, Vince McMahon has resigned the... TKO Group Holdings submitted an SEC filing Monday, recognizing officially that he is no longer with the company. They said that on January 26, 2024, Vincent K. McMahon notified the board of directors of TKO Group Holdings of his resignation from his positions as executive chair, a member of the board, any other positions, employment or otherwise, that he adds at TKO and its subsidiaries, in each case with immediate effect as of January 26, 2024. Came one day after former WWE employee Janelle Grant filed a lawsuit against him, WWE, and John Laurinaitis. I think that we've talked a lot about that. I don't want to go into more details. But the key that ties into the Rumble, besides Vince being gone, is that Brock Lesnar also was supposed to be in the Royal Rumble. And Brock Lesnar was removed from the Rumble over the weekend. Now, somebody had a had a good question here. They said, so Triple H claims that he didn't read the lawsuit, yet he knew enough to remove Brock Lesnar from the Rumble. Well, Brock Lesnar actually was not named in the lawsuit, but he was named in the Wall Street Journal article that came out several days before. So I'm not saying that I believe that Triple H did not read the lawsuit. I find that very hard to believe. But... He would have known about the Brock Lesnar deal without having read the lawsuit. It was all over the media. And, uh, you know, I've also had people state, well, you know, maybe the maybe it was, since they didn't mention who the former UFC heavyweight champion was, maybe it was Cain Velasquez. Idiots. It was not Cain Velasquez. Cain no, Velasquez. You, look, Brian, let me just jump in right there. If you read the thing and you actually, you know, spent the time to go through it, you would see that they talk about a superstar that was re-signed, and later on, they, it, it says it clearly in there, it happened around SummerSlam 2021. Yeah, it was 2021. That's when he made his return after nearly a year and a half of not being there because of WrestleMania, and there were talks at that. Again, everything is in there if you actually chose to, to read it, and even if you're not, trust the people that actually have some credibility who have. Well, it was 2021 that the meetings occurred, and Kane had been gone for two years at that point. So it was not Kane Velasquez. It was Brock Lesnar. And besides, if it wasn't Brock Lesnar, he'd have been in the Rumble. So he wasn't in the Rumble. So it, he was replaced in the Rumble by Braun Breaker. Braun Breaker took his spot. And so everything that happened in the Rumble was what was going to happen with Brock Lesnar. So... You know, when I first watched it, I was like, man, they're giving this Braun a huge push. God, look at this guy. He's just running through dudes. He's he's just smashing everybody. And then he gets thrown out by Dom. And at first I thought, you know, I like Dom and all, probably more than most. But I'm not sure that I would call up Braun Breaker to the main roster and have him run wild, only to be just thrown out by Dominic Mysterio. And uh, the reason that that happened was, has nothing to do with Braun. It had to do with Brock. Dominic was going to eliminate Brock Lesnar from the Royal Rumble. And this was going to lead to Brock absolutely obliterating Dom in uh, Australia. And then Brock Lesnar versus Gunther at WrestleMania. Now none of this will happen. I suppose it's possible maybe they'll bring back uh, Brock. But uh, I would be very surprised. I would be... uh, flabbergasted actually i don't think we're ever going to see brock again but i can't say that for sure no and they've set up braun already because of the social media that he's done after the fact saying he's going to stay on the judgment day it looks like he is being inserted right into that spot so 
there was a lot that happened this weekend. I mean, you didn't even mention Slim Jim pulling out, then returning as a sponsor. Rhonda's Kalma and on Bruce Pritchard. Uh, we will get to this, yes. Again, all of these things. It was a certainly a wild weekend in TKO stock. Now down to where it was pretty much today, where it was before the Netflix deal was announced. You know, kind of around 80 bucks and just kind of sitting there. So... We'll see what the long-term ramifications are on all of that sort of stuff. I'll just jump in to say this could open up an opportunity if you wanted to do something with Damian Priest cashing in that briefcase and not using that as a chip in his story with Drew McIntyre. I guess now could be the opportunity to do something like that with CM Punk being out. And I also wonder now at this point, CM Punk's going to be out at least nine months. I am sure we are going to see him back in a professional wrestling ring at some point down the line. But I also start to wonder, I'm not sure how long he signed for. And I know that he and Shawn Michaels have said a lot of nice things about each other. I wonder how long it's going to be before we end up seeing CM Punk in more of a role down there in NXT, uh, trying to help out the future and trying to help out Regal and those sorts of folks down there, as opposed to him being an actual threat to wrestle in the ring because these injuries keep mounting up. And as you continue to age, it probably isn't going to stop. Well, I want to continue with two things. Number one, you know, this Braun Breaker thing, this couldn't be better for Braun. Absolutely. Showing up in the Rumble running rough shot on everybody, do the match with him and Dom in Australia, a have him destroy Dom. McAfee? A spot with McAfee can go a lot of, go long distance for him. Well, I think that you should have him do Brock's match with, with uh, Dom in Australia, destroy the guy. And then I think that you should have Braun Breaker face Gunther at WrestleMania and beat him for the title. You couldn't do, you couldn't make a bigger star than, and this was dropped into their lap. And the other one dropped into their lap. Well, if CM Punk is unavailable... You know what? Drew McIntyre was supposed to win that title in a giant WrestleMania in front of tens of thousands of people, mm-hmm. and COVID resulted in nobody being there. That's what happened. And now you could do the exact... It's not the exact same thing, but fate could bring him to winning the championship from Seth Rollins in front of 80,000 people at WrestleMania. And that would be a great end to that story. Someone could finish their story. Back in a moment, Observer Live. When you think of your time four years on NXT, you were able to show people who you were, what kind of interviewer you were, and all of that. But the goal is eventually to get to Raw and SmackDown. Did you ever have any conversation surrounding that? Well, I think everybody wants to get to Raw and SmackDown, right? Like, I think that's kind of the goal in all of professional wrestling. I don't know if everyone feels the way feels that same way, but I think majority of people would want to get to Raw and SmackDown and be on the road and have those WWE moments. Um, I, of course, wanted that. I, of course, wanted at some point to get to Raw and SmackDown. But I also felt like NXT kind of became my home and people really loved me on NXT. Um, from everyone in the company it just they they just kept saying like i remember andy hartwell said something to me one time she's like when you think about nxt you're the best fit of an interviewer that i've ever seen for nxt and i don't know why i don't know why that is exactly or if people can put a finger on what that is exactly about me and nxt that made sense but it just made sense and then once my husband started doing commentary for nxt then it was like we were kind of this kind of this package deal with nxt too so I was able to tap into that and really create my own <clears throat> story within, X, in, within NXT in my own home, which I loved. Um, but it's hard to say that I wouldn't have ever wanted to go to Raw and SmackDown. I think part of the reason why you fit in with NXT was, well, your interview style, but also the fact that because you had been there, you knew everybody. And so it didn't feel like, oh, just new girl coming in and let's just rehearse these lines. Instead, it felt because you were there, you knew the people already, you knew their stories, you knew what was happening. And I think that familiarity is Mm -hmm. what really helped you, uh, you know, shine on, on NXT. And it was unique that I got to learn and work with new talent. You think about from the black and gold to NXT 2.0, that was really, um, nobody can, I don't know if many people can say that they went from black and gold into the NXT 2.0 into where we are now. And 
it was fun getting to work with new talent and new superstars such as Braun Breaker and Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams and Roxanne Perez even and them on the rise because I was able to work with the likes of Johnny and Candace and Tommaso and Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly Undisputed Era and then Raquel and then you go to a whole new era of what was 2.0 to where it was an adjustment but it was also really cool um and fun you have to evolve and so it was able I was able to evolve with all these talent and now I get to see them go off and succeed and see what Carmelo is doing on Smackdown right now and Dragon Lee and like all these it's it's really exciting because I was able to connect with all of these talent throughout their journey and be a crucial part of their journey I felt In the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Very quickly, Mike, what would you think of the Rumble? It was lacking, that's for sure. You know, I had some high hopes and big expectations, and I knew there wasn't much on there because, well, they had only announced four matches, but I thought we'd actually get something else thrown in there. We did not. And unfortunately, the four-way just did not help carry the show at all it did not add to the show at all unfortunately we knew roman reigns wasn't going to lose that match so okay can you do something during it that can you know get us really invested and have some good feelings coming out of it and you know unfortunately it didn't and logan paul and kevin owens was fantastic there was that i thought the women's rumble opening it up was actually pretty good i thought the use of Jade was was very good as well there. Now she needs to now go away again, and maybe we see her at WrestleMania, and then maybe we don't see her again for quite some time after that because she's, again, she's great at standing there and looking fantastic and pulling off a move here and there, but, you know, you could actually see it, and when you see it in the Royal Rumble, you can imagine how it would be if she's one-on-one -on -one with somebody, so... You know, I, I I hope the best. I thought they got a lot out of her that they could. I thought Jordan Grace and, and the use of her for somebody that, you know, again, didn't do a whole lot, didn't get any eliminations, I don't think, or anything like that. But I thought her presence really stood out. So I thought that was good. It was nice to see Naomi back. But then with the men's rumble, there just really was not enough surprises for me there was not enough you know again uh, what i want out of the royal rumble they just didn't give me enough of it during that match i enjoyed the end very much i liked the story there but when it came to some of the surprises and stuff like that i wasn't really big in on it i will say this though Pat McAfee is probably a, a really nice guy. I bet you he is, and I'm, I wish I had that kind of enthusiasm. I wish I had that kind of charisma and, and go get -itiveness that he has, and he's probably a very charitable man. Wrestling is about the only thing that I want to see Pat McAfee do. I, I hate him on game day. I'm just not – his show just doesn't jive with me at all. But as far as him – in wrestling and him doing announcing and him just being involved being himself i think it's fantastic and i do him being there i thought was a really nice surprise well the uh, women's royal rumble was won by bailey she tossed out the returning Liv morgan and a lot of botched spots but i thought the last probably 10 10 12 minutes was actually really good and the place did go nuts for Jade Cargill. And I thought the match ended on a high note. So in some ways, I, I would say that I liked it better than the men's match. The men's match didn't have nearly as many botched spots. But, I mean, if you if you watched it, you know, the big problem was just a lack of heat. And at the end, after, I guess, you know, Punk tearing his triceps probably didn't help. But, you know, the, the came down to Cody and CM Punk. And Punk just did not look good at all. He was tired. He was slow. He was hurt. And it just kind of dragged on. And then Cody finally threw him out. So it was kind of like, I, I've mentioned this a thousand times in my illustrious career. It reminds me of these old pay-per-views in the 90s. You'd watch these WWE pay-per-views. They'd have god-awful, atrocious undercards. But they'd have a great main event. So when the show was over, you're like, man, this show was awesome. Then you'd watch a WCW pay-per-view. They'd have this great undercard, all these awesome matches. And then they'd have a Hulk Hogan and Roddy Piper age in a cage. 
And when it's over, you're like, that was the worst show I've ever seen. So you remember what you saw there at the end. And, you know, watching those two matches, I came out of the women's rumble higher on that match than the men's rumble. And then we had the Roman Reigns, AJ, LA Knight, Randy Orton four-way. It was exactly what you'd think. Nobody thought he was going to beat Roman. There wasn't a lot of heat. And Roman pinned AJ. I mean, I think I did predictions for a, a cameo and called that one exactly as it went. And then Logan Paul beat Kevin Owens via DQ, and Logan tried to use brass knucks. Some One of his blokes, so-and-so in a white tee, threw knucks to <laughs> Logan Paul, but Kevin Owens got him, punched him out. And the way they did the uh, the zoom in onto the referee catching the knucks as he was counting three... Like, it was so good that it actually made me appreciate a DQ finish. This was the best match on the show. I mean, say what you want about Logan Paul, and everybody does. It was the best match on the show. So, uh... He's another guy, a lot, a lot like a McAfee. I don't want to see Logan Paul box. I don't want to see his brother box. I don't want to watch them on YouTube. I don't care about their podcasts. I don't care about them at all. But as far as what they do in that universe, literally the WWE universe, he's been fantastic. And I don't know what this is going to lead to later on. You know, I would love to see Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn against the Paul brothers. You know, I'd like to see Paul lose that belt to somebody. Dragon Lee would, would be a nice choice, but there could be a lot of guys he could lose it to. But if that's, you know, that to me could be a WrestleMania match. It would drive hardcores nuts. But that's the type of match I think that would be great for a WrestleMania. So, uh, that, Jeff in a white tee. Jeff in a white tee. That's the guy. So that, what does uh, he do? What does Jeff God do only knows, purpose? brother. I mean, it's a mystery. This is the biggest mystery in all of professional wrestling. What does Jeff in a white tee do? We need like, origin he was there last Jeff? time. He's the one that screwed Rey Mysterio, and nobody bothered to find was, out his last name. Was he the one what in the he does. bottle? Was he in the dancing around in a prime bottle at one of these things? He might have been. I think so. He was in a uh, white tee no this idea. time. He wasn't dressed as a bottle. I can tell you that a plain, much. A plain white tee? So anyway, that was the Royal Rumble, and it was uh, it was just there. You know, I did hear from somebody, and I you know this has happened a million times. It's, I've done it myself. When you go to a show in a stadium, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of different areas of the stadium. And, you know, I heard from people there that just went, man, it was just nobody cared they just were waiting for something to happen they were waiting for surprises and and every now and then they'd pop for something but you know just wasn't like a great crowd and i heard from another guy he goes i was in a box and they were just going wild all night i don't know why you didn't hear it on tv and you know you're going to be in areas in a big stadium where people are going nuts you're going to be in areas in a stadium where people aren't going nuts that's going to skew your vision of what the crowd was like but the fact of the matter is in these big, giant stadiums, the sound, it never travels all that great. Nope. I mean, man, I watch these Dynamites with 2,000 people, and they sound way more hot than the Royal Rumble. But I bet a lot more people than 2,000 were going nuts for that Rumble. But it used to be a problem in the Tokyo Dome as well. So it's just what it was. The show, as a viewer at home, it was just there. It wasn't like the greatest Rumble or anything. No, it, was it, an, oh, it was an okay show. A blessing and a curse when it comes to them and those shows and wanting as much money as possible and making it into a massive stadium event is you're going to have people that have drank and smoked themselves silly. You're going to have people there that are not as hardcore invested as, you know, possibly the, the people two rows ahead of them who, you know, are listening to this show right now and losing their minds and all about a lot of stuff. So it's it's just one of those it's just one of those things where that's the trade-off that you're going to have sometimes when it comes to those shows. And if a show's not red hot throughout the entire thing, you know, then it's going to be tough sometimes. By the way, Dave's got an article up on the front page. He's going to be doing these regularly. Uh, these are subscriber-only articles. You must be a subscriber to WrestlingObserver.com. But he's got all the details on the CM Punk injury in there right now if you want to go up there and check that out. And uh, many more to come. The uh, big stories in The Observer used to just all come out on Friday, but we're going to be releasing them throughout the week now and then compiling everything together for the Friday Observer. So if you want to know what's going on, sign up at WrestlingObserver.com and you'll get all the news first. And also my uh, Twitter subscriptions. I know it's Twitter. 
So we don't make a damn thing off your Twitter. Push the website, please. Well, I did push the website. WrestlingObserver.com is the best place to go because you get your shows too. You yeah, know? you get like you the, lots of cool Mike shows. Big Audio Nightmare. That's what you should. Be yeah, that one too. To too. Yep. Yeah, we had a great one last night. Brian of any show. Yeah, Lisa Gifford appeared to just skewer old Vince. Eviscerate a well-deserved skewering. Mm-hmm. So yes, yeah, Slim Jim. I got to tell you, man, I don't want to make light of it. It's not funny, but it is an irony. All those years that I watched those WWE programs and Vince McMahon is there with his spectacles on and he's just the friendly announcer and then he throws it to snap into a Slim Jim. <laughs> and he does the commentary with old Macho Man Randy Savage. When he, a lot of throat on that Slim Jim. When he thought Macho Man was just too old to do this, even though Macho just wanted to wrestle and you could always tell there was just tension between the two of them and then Macho left and went to WCW and then... He was just never mentioned by WWE again. He was persona non grata. And there were all these rumors and everything like that. And then Slim Jim in 2024 ends up the biggest WWE sponsor that they've got. Their most lucrative sponsor. And they hear about this Vince McMahon lawsuit. And right before the Royal Rumble, they pull their sponsorship. And it was mere hours after pulling that sponsorship that that was the end of Vince McMahon. And then Slim Jim came back. Slim Jim. It's like, when you really think about it, it's incredible that it all came down after all those decades to Slim Jim pulling their sponsorship. And that really is likely what got rid of Vince McMahon. Amazing. I mean, think about this all came out and he was forced to step down and he just came back. And granted, it was different. It was his company. It's not now. But that's quite the story. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Um, well, I was super excited. Like, um, you know, when I, when I joined the AW and it was the Blackpool Combat Club, I was like, oh, yeah, it just, like, people ask me, how do you feel? I'm like, I feel like it's just right. Like, it just, yeah, yeah, I, just, I get up another day and it's like, I've always been part of it, you know? And and, and uh, with Brian, again, like, I've known him for almost 20 plus years now, uh, all over the world. Like you said, we've been in the ring um, all over the world and like, just also just hung out and traveled together for so long um, that it's been so much fun. Um, you know, just being around him a lot. And, uh, you know, I always mentioned the, the BCC group chat because it seems to get people jealous that they're, <laughs> that they're not in it. Um, uh, there's also a, a, a BCC book club, I think, that just got founded. So, yeah. Um, Wait, did that just start? I mean, we just we just started our first book that we we're all reading together. So, yeah, I think that's going to be a thing as, as well. Because I know Brian said that he reads three books at the same time. So is he making you guys do this or was this uh, like a joint thing? No. So I feel like uh, so. So Brian has been reading for, for a long time and he reads a lot of books. Uh, I think he reads like at least one a week or something like that, which is incredible. Um, I just started reading a lot more this year and i know uh, max reads quite a bit as well so we were just kind of like oh what if we just kind of do a book club thing we just all read like a similar like the same book and then talk about it and we were like oh, sure yeah why not so uh, we're forcing yuda to read as well um no <laughs> i mean like yuda was always reading but you know we're just um, now doing this kind of thing so so it, it that just kind of sums it up how much fun it is it's been with with brian and then uh, to to your second part of the of the question um, you know, if 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 this is his last uh, year full time wrestling, I'm extremely happy to have had that match with him. Um, because we were kind of talking, it was like the last couple of matches we had were in front of uh, nobody or screens in the Thunderdome era, and then before that, it was like tag matches and this and that. But like singles wise, I think it was like a gauntlet match years ago, like doesn't it? 14 or 15 or something like that when I was still with um, Zeb and Swagger. And then obviously, you know, before that Ring of Honor. So it, it's been actually been quite a while. And um, I mean, I was extremely happy that I was able to wrestle him 
for that long in front of an audience on TV and uh, just go in there and have fun. And, uh, you know, like if we can do it again, like uh, I would obviously love to, but if not, I feel like, you know, if Brian is kind of going, you know, if this is his last year, he's just going down the list of fun stuff that he wants to do. And I was glad to have been part of it. Not so glad about that draw since it cost me the, the tournament, but you know, you win some, you lose some. Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, BB, also WrestlingObserver.com. Oh, man, now what? You guys want to talk about? Why don't you, uh, why don't you text me? 425-780-7566. Questions, comments, where should we go? I could talk forever. It's easy. For example, did you know we got a lot of shows coming up? Mm -hmm. We got Raw tonight which has Gunther versus Kofi Kingston for the Intercontinental title, Damian Priest and Finn Balor versus DIY, and Jey Uso versus Bronson Reed. That's the lineup for tonight. Tomorrow's NXT, Ilya Dragunov and Trick Williams face-to-face, -face. Noam Dar versus Von Wagner for the Heritage Cup, Lola Vice, Electra Lopez, Roxanne Perez, Tatum Paxley, we got Cruz Del Toro and Joaquin Wilde versus Carmelo and Trick, and Chase, you says goodbye. And this, of course, leads to the Vengeance Day show, which actually is Sunday. I pulled a Gunther. Wrong day. It's actually Sunday. And the lineup has Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin versus whoever goes to the finals of the Dusty Classic on Tuesday. Tony Stacks and Adriana Rizzo versus OTM and Jada Parker. Holy smokes. <laughs> Holy smokes. Oba Femi versus Dragon Lee for the North American title. Lyra versus Roxanne for the NXT women's title. And Ilya Dragunov versus Trick Williams. And if you guys watched SmackDown on Friday night, they did a segment, and uh, Carmelo Hayes was there. He was getting beaten down by Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. And, man, they hit Trick Williams' music, and uh, that place went nuts. And... I know people are going to say it was crowd sweetening, but it wasn't because I talked to people who were there. They went nuts for Trick. And uh, I'll just say that that did not go unnoticed, the reaction to Trick Williams when he showed up on SmackDown. So we'll see what happens this coming weekend, but that guy is over. That guy is definitely over. Then we have Dynamite in New Orleans on Wednesday. They are at 1642. Mm. According to WrestleTix. An AEW Dynamite show. 1,600 fans at this point. The lineup. As we now know, it is Swerve Strickland versus apparently Rob Van Dam in the Dealer's Choice match. Hangman Page versus Toa Leona. Diana Parazzo and Taya Valkyrie. And just added this weekend, Chris Jericho and Kyle Fletcher. That is an incredibly weak card. 1,642 fans at this point. In a 9,000-seat building that they only had set up for less than 2,100. Yes. So, you know, maybe utilize Daly's Place a little more often maybe every other week i don't know there's got to be a better way <laughs> there's got to be a better way and again maybe you're getting the sweetest of, of the deals on some of these places but like i don't know you're going to college towns when classes are in and not drawing people you're going to big cities like st louis with great traditions and i i just i don't know what the answer is exactly I, I I don't, you know, and they have a new team that, that seems to be in there, but something has got to be done pretty fast when it comes to these things because it's great to draw 90,000 people or, you know, whatever the, the Wembley number was, and it's great where every, you know, once in a while you can do huge shows like that, but when every week you're coming out there, this week, 
you know, literally this week. It's it's not good. And the fact they look, they don't. A lot of it is also going to be a slow build back too, because they don't have stars and they need to establish their stars again, and they need to motivate their base and shake their base and continue to to try to grow this thing. But you know, they are stuck between uh, what eight hundred thousand to usually eight hundred and fifty thousand people every week. It's just it's very very stagnant right now and. There's no easy answer. It's not going to happen overnight, but you can at least get a lot more energy out of a daily place crowd than you can 1,600 people in a 9,000-seat building. Well, I will say this, okay? One of the suggestions we did a show a week ago, and Dave wanted to talk about, what could Paul learn from Tony and vice versa? And one of the things we talked about in regards to these house show numbers, or these, these uh, they're not house shows, or TV, TV tapings, is like we need to know what the hell's going on. We need lineups. We need we need big matches announced. We need stories, and, dude. And they weren't doing that. And now, I mean, to their credit, you know, as of last Wednesday, they've started announcing multiple shows in advance. We know next week's Dynamite's two top matches, and that's Chris Jericho and Takeshita, and Ricky Starks and Big Bill versus but Sting it, and Darby. Well, hold on. It, it, next ahead. week's show is already at thirty six hundred. They've they've sold significantly more tickets than this coming Wednesday's show because those are two big matches that have been announced well in advance. And I'm sure there are other reasons as well. It's Phoenix, Arizona, but it's the Footprint Center. I mean, they've set it up for 5,200. But, I mean, we need matches in advance. You need stories to lead to those matches, though. You need well, to exactly, have, but we you, still you, need to know the matches. You're right. You can't have Collision coming up and not know what's on the show. You yeah, ain't gonna buy but, tickets for that. But you also need to have things going on where people want to go because there are things going on. Even if I, I don't know everyone that's going to be there or every match that's going to to take place, I need to be motivated enough to go buy these tickets, and they need. Again, they, it's not just matches. It's not just matches, and that needs to be said, and that needs to be focused on. It's not just matches, and just putting a bunch of matches, they have to be attached to stories that people care about and that you care about to put some thought into. And there's also, obviously, the uh, ticket price issue, which must be addressed. I mean, it's it's hard because, you know, when you're selling 1,600 tickets, it's hard to sell tickets for 20 bucks. I mean, you're going to lose your... But, I mean, $80, you know, oh, I've heard crazy. a lot of people complain that, like, you know, they could get into the Rumble for 20 bucks, and then there's an AW Dynamite show in a 2000 you know, there's 80 bucks is the cheapest they could get in. So, you know, family of four, you're talking 320 bucks, and then whatever fees on top of that and everything. And that's what makes you think that they're not getting great deals on these buildings because you're still doing that. And granted, you need to pay to go on the road. You need to pay talent and, and, and all the, the bells and whistles that you do. You do need to make some of that back. But, I mean, that's just silly to have those types of prices, especially when, again, things have been the way that they've been. You know, this there's an idea that we can make concert tickets Whatever we want, because if you're willing to go to it, same thing with the Super Bowl and with sporting events like that. And to a point, that's true. For All In, maybe you can go ahead and do that. For Forbidden Door, you can go ahead and do that. But for your run-of-the-mill shows, you can't do that. And you also need to look at maybe going with lower ticket prices to not the UNO Lakefront Arena and instead go to a different building that's maybe a little more starved in an area that you may be able to to try to get people in the building that way. Again, I, I why they choose some of these buildings at their size is is crazy to me. It really is. I was talking about this guy on the board blaming Samoa Joe. Oh, stop. Listen, you can't blame... I know Joe is the champion, but dude... They didn't even announce Joe was going to be on the show till a day before the other day. They said he was going to speak. Well, of course he's not going to sell a ticket. I mean, you have to advertise who's what stars are going to be on the show. If you are building every single show around Samoa Joe, Samoa Joe in a big match on this show, Samoa Joe in a big match on this show, and nobody is showing up, then then we can talk. But that's not happening. Collision, this Collision show on on uh, which I got to talk about by the way. Collision on Saturday, it's like a week before the show, they had one match announced. There's going to be a cage match. That's it. Well, who else is going to be on the show? 
Is Joe going to be there? I don't know. Sting, Darby? I don't know. Moxley? I don't know. No idea. I don't so, know. If it's 80 bucks, I got to pay $320 to bring my family. And I have no idea if the people my kids or my wife like are going to be even on the show. Then, yeah, I think twice about whether I'm going to buy tickets. Look, over time, that was a big kick in the crotch to WCW is the fact that you kept getting, and a lot of that was false advertising too, but you literally would show up, have no idea who was going to be there. Not a clue in what the matches were going to be, and you got people out there twice, you got mixed match teams and all that sort of stuff. And again, not, that's not what AEW is doing, but again, when you lose when you lose people at that core level who won't even come out, you know, in their depressed town to your house show, you know, that can be a very, very bad thing. Thing. So, I don't know. I, I again. This, and MJF did not kill AEW he did not tickets. Kill AEW tickets. MJF's pay per views did extremely well. His quarters were virtually always the will. highest rated segment on the show. Again, Anybody well, that, else want to come up with some stupid well, excuse got, when the obvious is staring you right in the face? It's got nothing to do with tickets. Because while he was there, it's not like they were moving a bunch of tickets. And again, that's why you can't blame Joe even for this. you got to give him time to try to build it back up. If you're putting everything on the champion, it's not exactly fair to do. So, I don't know. The whole thing is just they need to find a better mousetrap and they seem to again they've made a bunch of moves to to seemingly do that you know with new people in charge they started pushing advertising more locally getting people to show up at tv stations and all that sort of stuff so obviously they know there's a problem it's just going out there and fixing it and i talked about daily's place one thing you might want to use Daly's Place for or maybe go back and utilize Baltimore or Philadelphia or something for is Ring of Honor. Stop attaching Ring of Honor. First of all, I think Ring of Honor should be a YouTube show anyway at this point. It should be something that much like, you know, what Explosion is going to be for TNA Plus that you film, you give it to the people that are, you know, buying Honor Club, you give it to them in advance, but then you put it out for everybody a couple of days later because it's hard to build up any momentum for that show. And what it ends up doing with these long marathon 17 match ROH shows is people don't want to see that after collision after they go to a collision show they don't i'm sorry they just don't it's been proven you can't keep enthusiasm up it just doesn't work even big tv tapings back in the day with stars on them that would go on for hours and hours people didn't want to see that and it takes away from the product so unless you're doing a bunch of sweetening it doesn't help so why not go ahead and put roh in daily's place try to cultivate a fan base down there that comes out that makes it a hot thing and a hot place that you want to be and at least you can do it that way so again when people see it on youtube they can be maybe a little more invested and the packages that you can put together to try to sell the pay-per-views you know would be probably worth a lot more imagine if you had that leading into that athena billy stark show you know to me it probably would have been a lot better off should note that the uh, collision show this weekend, since it was brought up on our show and also by Brody on, on Twitter. So that match was always supposed to be Escape the Cage Rules. When they first announced it, they put up a graphic and it just said Elimination Cage Match. And later they changed the graphic to Escape the Cage. And so, you know, it was uh, the presumption was that they changed it after the announcement. And, in fact, they changed the graphic. The graphic definitely changed. But from day one... No, it was always a bad idea, folks. No, I, well, I'm telling you, I can. this is not from, from anybody in the match. From There were other people there that said it was always supposed to be elimination. It just, for some reason, they announced one thing and then they announced it a different way. But it was always going to be elimination cage. Now, why? I mean, I think it's obvious. But, uh, you know... Because folks don't want to do jobs. I'll just go ahead and say it for you. And again, terrible, terrible match, terrible waste to everybody involved there. And Actually, the match know, was quite great, except for the, I don't the think ridiculous was. booking. Nah, it was, come on. It was a very formulaic. You do the brawl to start, then Garcia comes out there. And again, once I saw Mark Briscoe thrown through a table as if he wasn't going to come back and get some revenge at the end, to me, it was way too telegraphed. No, thank you. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Getting to um, 
I want to go ahead and shift into Continental Classic because you just mentioned it. Uh, a really, really great tournament that AEW has put together with top-notch competitors. I mean, you got to go in there with Andrade, with Brian Danielson. Loved uh, seeing you guys go to the time limit draw. That was awesome. Uh, Daniel Garcia, young guy in this who's been killing it. Eddie Kingston, Brody King. Uh, all of these people that you've got to mix it in with. What was your impression when you first heard of the Continental Classic that, that this was going to be happening? And how did you feel getting to take part in the first one and in the tournament of this caliber? Um, I was very excited, you know. Um, <laughs> right before I uh, joined AEW, uh, I was I was extremely close, like <laughs> probably a couple of days away uh, before doing the G1 for New Japan. And I always want to do the G1, and I still own one, I feel like. So um, to do the Continental Classic, um, I was super excited. And it also, to me, um, I feel like I'm at my best when I get into a routine, so to speak. And with the Continental Classic, it's like, you know you wrestle every week. And like then again, like looking back, I was like, I pretty much wrestled every week multiple times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, to me, to me, it's always like, okay, every cool. And then I looked at the both groups and or like all the talent announced, which is awesome because I was like, oh yeah, there's like, there's not one person that I wouldn't want to be in the ring with. And then um, I saw the the brackets or whatever, and I, you know, the blue group, and I'm like, this is like, every single competitor is like top level. Every single competitor, it's going to be fun and a big challenge, and every match is going to be different, right? So. Um, I think, I mean, the gold group was fun to watch as well, but I feel like the blue group just had like so many different styles and competitors in it. And it was so much fun, not just for for me, I feel like my, you know, fellow competitors as well and for the, the viewers because you kind of knew what matches you were getting. I mean, like you knew what the matches were like right when you look at it through, like, oh my God, I'm going to get all those matches. But you didn't really know quite when. You know, so it's like it's it's still that like cool, and then it gets announced, and it's cool, and you can look forward to it. Um, and then, of course, it all came down to the last day, which was a lot of fun. I feel like for for everybody watching, and it's not quite over yet. So it's you know, it's, it's been a very good thing uh, for AW and and the fans. And I just brought it down to to me what wrestling is because it's fun, it's sports, it's storytelling, and um, you know, I, you've seen all the guys do like the, the interviews and the promos and then like the matches and it's just everybody put their heart and soul into it and you can tell. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. So in about an hour, Filthy Tom Lawler is going to join us here today. We'll talk about SmackDown in depth, all these segments on the show, all of the news, and whatever else is on his mind. And then, on Wednesday, we will have a figure four daily at 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern with Lance Storm. And I think he wants to spend the entire hour giving his thoughts on this whole Vince McMahon deal. Wow. So, yeah, he's got a lot to say. Well, so, I'm also wowing over the fact here, too, he can talk about Newsweek and he can talk about the media maybe holding some heat to WWE because, yeah, Slim Jim reneged on their deal. or not reneged, but pulled out and then jumped back in again. I hadn't seen too many articles. I saw the New York Times had one written on the story that was new, but now Newsweek has got one. This is the headline, WWE faces boycott calls over sexual slavery accusations. It's a pretty stiff headline right there. Well, that'll be coming up on Wednesday. And then later on tonight, Wrestling Observer Radio with Dave Meltzer. All of these available for subscribers, WrestlingObserver.com, as well as our video channel, Video.F4WOnline.com, which is on YouTube. And if you go to YouTube, F4WOnline.tv, you can subscribe there. we got new videos up every day, so uh, check it out. And uh, that's it, everybody. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. We'll talk to you in an hour. Wrestling Observer Live. <laughs>